So I got this great comment the other day, right? It was from uh, at Gary WK Fung on whether personas make the Apple Vision Pro a better product. And I want to read it to you. I never commented on YouTube videos in my life, but I have to chime in here because of just how the point is completely missed by the video and the rest of the comments. The question here isn't whether eyesight is creepy. Of course it's creepy. But anything novel is at least a little uncanny. The real question is whether it's a better or worse headset without it. Apple is choosing the lesser of two evils in pursuit of spatial computing. And if you have used this device with a family around you for an extended period of time, you'll undoubtedly realize that you were better off without it than without. With it than without, sorry. Quest, for example. Another person next to you will get over the creepiness over time, but there's no getting used to not being able to tell if you can see me or not. My kid comes up to me and just starts talking to me because it's assumed that when my creepy eyes are shown, he is listened to. If I was wearing the Quest, every conversation will have to start with, Dad, can you see me? Dad, you in the middle of something? People here critiquing eyesight haven't actually owned the device or not used it in a group setting. Eyesight is here to stay. Apple once again made the right human interface call to no one's surprise. This is not a feature they will cut. In fact, they will probably double down and upgrade the quality in version two. And I immediately replied when I saw this comment saying that I think that he hit on, a, that Gary hit on a, right, a lot of right things here, right? Um, and that I had thoughts and that today's video would, would most likely be about it. Um, and it's true. Um, I said that because I agree that there is a higher order question here, right? And it's not whether the, the thing is creepy or not right now, right? And whether, and I agree that whether it makes it a better headset is a higher order question that you could ask about it, right? But I think that if you just ask whether or not it's a better headset, it misses a lot of the gray in the middle um, because there are other ways you can implement the same feature, right? Um, so we agree on what eyesight is trying to achieve. We agree that a feature like eyesight is necessary, but it sounds like we might disagree on whether eyesight was the right approach right now. So I wanted to look into that. It's funny, the, uh, the group of people that do not use quality in their marketing are the Japanese. You never see them using quality in their marketing. It's only the American companies that do. And yet, if you ask people on the street which products have the best reputation for quality, they will tell you the Japanese products. Now, why is that? How could that be? The answer is because customers don't form their opinions on quality from marketing. They don't form their opinions on quality from who won uh, the Deming Award or who won the Baldrige Award. They form their opinions on quality from their own experience with the products or the services. And so one can spend enormous amounts of money on quality. One can win every quality award there is. And yet if your products don't live up to it, customers will not keep that opinion for long in their minds. Hello, puppy. So I wanted to start off with some assertions about eyesight or the feature, you know, that's kind of about attention awareness for someone, right? The first one is that spatial computing requires the computer to have some way of signaling to the outside world that the wearer can see the outside world. So what do I mean by that when I say that? Spatial computing, right, is basically just being able to put your apps into the real world. Bottom line, that's all spatial computing is. The compromises are insane to get there. You have to perceive reality all the time through screens to do that right now. Right. Which... You shouldn't you shouldn't do that. <laughs> like uh -huh. so I, I know. Like I can look at this thing and say, this isn't it. And do you know who agrees with me to Scott's question about Tim Cook? Tim Cook agrees <laughs> with me. Tell, he has tell been me saying this yeah. since 2013. I have all these quotes in my review. Tim Cook in 2016. Few people are going to view that it's acceptable to be enclosed in something. Mm -hmm. Tim Cook 2017. Virtual reality closes the world out. AR allows individuals to be present in the world. 2017. I also like the fact that AR doesn't isolate. I've never been a fan of VR because I think it does the opposite. Right. The technology to build what they want. 
glasses. That's what they That's want. That's where they're going. Uh, they can't build it. It doesn't exist. So they had to build this VR headset and build like a simulation of what it might be like. And that is going to totally close this market down until they can build the technology that enables the product that everybody actually wants. Right, so me... Tim Cook has talked about this for a long time. Augmented reality is a less idol- isolating experience than virtual reality, right? But with a headset, once you have when, when you have augmented reality, your eyes are still closed off to the outside world. So as you are the user, right, you get to see the outside world, which is great. But to an outside observer, <laughs> part of the outside world looks at you, they can't tell what's going on. Uh, this is what Gary talked about, right? It is so important that the outside world also becomes a user of the device that you are the primary user of, right? And that's what eyesight is. That's why there's a display not only on the inside of the thing, but on the outside of the thing. Now, in spatial computing, right, because your apps are out in the world, other people won't be able to see that. But for human connection, the important thing is that they can see you and that they know that you're paying attention to them. So that's assertion number one, that spatial computing requires the computer to be able to tell the outside world that the person using the computer can see the outside world. I can see you and you can see me. The second assertion, there is some flexibility in how eyesight is implemented. The need for it will always be there. Until we can see your eyes, the need for it will always be there. How it's implemented, there is some flexibility. So even if they don't ditch it entirely for a cheaper and lighter model, you can imagine a much, much simpler version of eyesight that shows like two big cartoon eyeballs. In fact, Apple has patents related to this exact thing and maybe they even prototyped it and thought it was dumb. But boy, you can make that way lighter if you do like two monochrome e-ink screens on the outside of the goggles that look like googly eyes that don't even pretend to look like your eyes. Or even like, I mean, I think it was in their patent, like text, like a text display that says, I can currently see you or whatever, you know what I mean? So Syracuse here talks about the different options just a couple of silly options that Apple may have used uh, in in lieu of eyesight, right? Uh, big cartoon eyeballs, googly eyes on the front of the thing, text, scrolling text that says, I can see you, I can see you, I can see you, or I can't see you, right? And um, that gets at the kind of core of what I wanted to talk about, which is kind of criteria for attention awareness on a device like this uh, and how the device communicates that and what the options would be in that case. So let's talk about uh, th- that criteria, right? Signals, so the, the, the criteria for signals sent by a computer should have kind of, I think, three big things, right? The first one, very simple, that I think we agree on, the computer should be able to communicate the wearer's attention effectively. It should be obvious, basically, uh, or it should be con- c- consistent in communicating to the outside world that, hey, I can see you. The second thing, it should be intelligible to someone with essentially no training. Now, there's a weird thing that I think speaks to the nature of the isolation of this product, which is that when you put it on, there is an asymmetry between you and the outside world. You can see the outside world, right? And uh, you have some view into this, you know, digital realm, basically, that lives on top of the world in some way or another, right? But someone from the outside should be able to have an immediate understanding of whether you are immersed or not immersed. Here's the other asymmetry. You spend a lot of time with the device as an owner of it, but someone who's never seen an Apple Vision Pro before may have no idea what's going on, right? Um, so say you walk into a Starbucks with your Apple Vision Pro on, or you're one of those cloud chasers out there, right? That's going and, and, uh, parking your, your uh, uh, cyber truck next to uh, a Starbucks and walking in with your Apple Vision Pro. You walk in, you talk to the, the barista who probably has no idea what the Apple Vision Pro is, right? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. But I would say that the majority of the population right now, at the very least, I'm just using baristas as kind of like a random sample, right? Uh, random sample. To, uh, and it, you're asking them to now interface with you in some way. They've never seen an Apple Vision Pro before. How do they know whether or not you are paying attention to them without any training? You're, you're in this thing all day, maybe, or at least, you know, on a regular basis. You have a lot of training with it. 
but someone on the outside who doesn't have training, they need to have an immediate understanding of what the device is trying to tell them, what the affordance is. The last one. An attention-aware feature on a headset like this should encourage the wearer to use the headset in shared settings rather than discourage them. We'll get to that one in a second, but let me go through those three again. Communicate the wearer's attention effectively. Be intelligible to someone with essentially no training and encourage the wearer to uh, uh, use the headset in a public setting. So let's go down the list and let's kind of go through John's three hypotheticals along with eyesight, so four total, and see whether uh, they stack up to these three criteria. Okay. The first one, communicate the wearer's attention effectively. Let's check with eyesight. Does eyesight let the outside world know that you can see them? Absolutely. It's trying to mimic your eyeballs. So there's no questions asked. If you can see my eyeballs and I can see yours, my attention is most likely on you, right? I've directed it at you. What about cartoon eyeballs? Well, for the most part, yeah. If I have cartoon eyeballs, uh, people would get used to that over uh, you know, a pretty quick period of time. We're used to seeing things like that on like Snapchat or, or TikTok or filters and things like that. You understand pretty quickly that if I was looking at you with these cartoon eyes, that my attention is on you. What about e-ink googly eyes? Basically the same thing. It's a special case of the cartoon eyeballs, right? Uh, and what about text? Well, if it says, I can pay attention to you, as long as you are uh, able to read that text, you, uh, that, that attention is communicated effectively, right? If it says, I can't see you, same thing. Great. What about the second criteria? Be intelligible to everyone with essentially no training. I would say that eyesight falls somewhere on the continuum there, but more often than not, people would understand. This is exactly what Gary was saying. Because we have an instinctual understanding of what eyeballs are communicating, right? When Miso looks at me, I know that she wants me to throw her ball. <laughs> it does not require a lot of training for people to understand that. I understand that my dog wants my attention when she looks at me. And she understands that when I look at her, I'm giving her that attention. With a headset, for the most part, with at least another human, they would probably understand that. What about with cartoon eyeballs? Cartoon eyeballs probably would. I think less so. I think initially, right, someone may think, oh, well, it's just googly eyes strapped on the front. Again, eating googly eyes are just a special case of these cartoon eyeballs. That said, I think it's a facsimile that's close enough to your actual eyes that it's okay. What about the third thing? Text. Text, um, I think, is actually maybe the most distinct. It actually does do a great job of, of uh, communicating what your attention is to the outside world. It's very hard to misinterpret, I can see you right now, unless you think it's like some like abstract art piece, uh, or I cannot see you right now, unless you think it's some weird thing that's like somebody's making a joke or whatever, right? What about the third one, though? I think most of these uh, approaches would hold up to those first two criteria. But the third criteria, which is to encourage the wearer to use the headset in shared settings, that one is more interesting. <laughs> now, let's start, let's go through the, the, the few again and then kind of go through an analysis of, of my feelings about this one because I think that this one was sort of crafted, this criteria I crafted to speak to the core of the issue here, right? Starting with eyesight. So eyesight, I don't, I think in some cases it encourages people to wear it in a shared setting. In some cases it doesn't. I personally can say that I feel awkward wearing the, the headset out in public for many different reasons. But one of which is that I feel like when people see those eyes, right, that they get the same feeling that I got when I first saw it on uh, the uh, WWDC announcement, right? I get kind of creeped out in some ways. The um, second thing was the cartoon eyeballs. Cartoon eyeballs, I think, would be okay in some settings and not okay in other settings. It might be a little weird if you're not comfortable with like having this kind of weird cartoon eye on the front. Eating googly eyes fall in the same category. And the text, it seems just pure dorky to me. It seems more like a beta feature than not. So as far as those four go, eyesight maybe is the best approach, right? But again, with the creepy thing, I'm not exactly sure that it is worth the trade-off to have this thing be in public, right? 
uh, for the people who are not comfortable with people thinking that it might be creepy or not, right? So, like, eyesight ends up being this hack, basically, this technical hack that attempts to fix the isolating nature of Apple Vision Pro, of putting a screen in front of your eyes instead of having glasses that you look through. And that was the point of the clown video, right? That emotions are not always conveyed properly with personas. Just the Vision Pro, which you mentioned in your review, which I think other people did as well, it is inherently an isolating experience. Yeah. Right? To some degree. Now, the pass-through attempts to mitigate that by showing you the world around you. And, of course, the eyesight is for the other people so that they don't feel isolated from you even though you have it on. But it's inherently a singular solo experience for now until they figure out the interconnectivity of it all more or make it so that owning multiple of these in a household is more likely. The one thing I know from early use is you don't want it to scrunch your face because that right. actually has an impact on your facial expression in your, in your digital persona. The first time I put mine on and got on a face call, I realized that it was like sitting weird against my forehead and I looked angry. I looked at ang huh. angry at, uh, at the people I was talking to. So there you go. If I'm angry and it doesn't convey that I'm angry in an exactly human way, you might fall into that uncanny valley. That might be where that creepiness comes from. That was the clown thing, right? But <laughs> at the same time, um, it doesn't really seem like there's a better option out there. Even the things that Apple has patented are not ultimately a better option in this case. And I think that that was Gary's point, which is that you cannot ship this product without this feature, right? It is maybe the most defining feature of Apple Vision Pro because of what it symbolizes. And it symbolizes it not to the wearer, but to everyone else around you who most likely does not have an Apple Vision Pro, what it actually is doing. It's letting you see through to the world in a way that most other headsets only make a passable attempt at. So Gary, thank you for the great comment. Um, I had a, fun, a lot of fun with this one, thinking through how I'd approach it. And I think you're right. I think that eyesight is probably the best approach. Um, yeah. So thanks for watching. And uh, please, I want to hear everyone's th uh, thoughts in the comments. I really enjoy making these videos that respond to the comments. And I think that that might be uh, an important part of this channel into the future. Um, say bye to me, so too. <laughs>